commission that is being split 50-50 with the buyer side, and you are my agent and we are on a 70-30 split, my question is how much did I earn in this deal? Somebody's calculator is going fast. Anybody get the same number I did? Yes. Everybody see how that came about? Yes. All right. So now, if the house was five and a half percent, and the commission check for both sides was 17 grand. How much did the house sell for? The entire commission was 17,000. It's a cool number. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you. 17,000 divided by five and a half percent. Equals that number. Commission spit, seller's proceeds, buyer's funds needed to close. Watch for the trick. You know, if you see that trick where they said, oh, you know, how much loan origination fee? Back to this. It's kind of messed up, but you can see that this was the number that we came up with. 7200 so my question to you would be how much did the seller need to or the buyer need to bring to closing please do not get fooled or tricked that they still have to bring the 20 percent which is going to be 90 grand all right so make sure you under, did I ask you how much the fee on the loan was or did I ask you how much the buyer had to bring to closing? Because when typically they, most people forget if he's got an 80% loan to value, he has to bring the other 20% with him as equity or down payment and that is one of the fees. If he has submitted earnest money to me, that would not be calculated in this money. So let's change this story even further. If he put $5,000 down as earnest money when they wrote the offer, you would subtract that and he would need to bring 92,200 because this he gets credit for the day he wrote the offer. Here's the down or here's the 20% down and here's the 7200 for the loan. 
So this would be what he needs to bring now because we have to credit him the earnest money. Everybody see what I'm saying? It. Yeah. Is that a yes, Nicole? Thumbs up? Oh, yes. Okay. There is a question like that where they ask you where he has to give earnest money. Remember, subtract that off the money they bring because he's already brought that. Let's do a little appraisal evaluation and valuation. Remember, there is a business thing that says gross operating income minus expenses equals net operating income. We need this to calculate the cap rate. In the exam, the cap rate you will not be able to figure, so it will usually tell you in the question to help you out. The cap rate is a return on investment, is almost always expressed as a percentage. And all you need to do to figure the value is, uh, what is it, NOI divided by cap rate equals value. So if I told you it had a $22,000 NOI and the cap rate's 0 0.08, you could then figure the value of this property, 22 divided by 0 0.0, oops, cleared that one, is 275000 $275,000. So we listed it at an 8% cap rate and we listed the property at 275. We got an offer at 259 and my seller took it. What cap rate did I sell the property at? We listed it at 275. We got offered 259 and he took it. So my question is, what cap rate did we actually sell it at then? So my question is, I'm trying to move this around a little. Using this equation, I'm asking you now what's the cap rate? So I can move that over there and move the value over. I have NOI over value equals cap. I got so what's the Go ahead. I got point zero eight five which is eight and a half percent. Yes. That's what I got. Okay. I got 8.49. Okay. So now the difference, the only difference here is we now have a new value. The value we use is what we literally actually sold it for. It's still got the 22,000 NOI, but now it's 259, you get that cap rate. So we listed it at an 8% cap, but we actually sold it to an investor at an 8.49% or 8.5% cap. Are 
Are we good? How does yeah. the cap relate to the um, overall value of the property? Like inversely related, you know, as cap, cap goes up, value goes. Yes, exactly. The cap is the relation between the NOI to the value. And they are, as you can see, as the price went down, the cap went up. And a lot of people at first have a problem with this. They think the price went from 275 to 259. The cap is going to go down. No, if they are inversely re relation. So the cap went up. And it actually went up what? 16th? It was a five per five percent cap at a three million dollar valuation. How much is the NOI? What's the income that's generated off this? If the cap is five and a half percent. At a three million dollar value, how much is the NOI? How much income is this property throwing off every year? That is literally a straightforward 0. 0.055 times 3 million equals 165. Did we do um, depreciation the other day? Yeah, we did, because I used this ruler. Remember, if the property is 400, the land's worth 100, and it's got a 30-year economic life, how much is the property worth in seven years based on straight line depreciation. Four hundred thousand value, a hundred thousand in land. I got the property worth in seven years, three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Right? First thing you got to do is do what? Subtract the land value out because we're only going to deal with this. So the value of the structure is 300 grand, 30 year time frame. That means the depreciation is $10,000 per year. After seven years, it's depreciated $70,000. Take that off the 300, so you got 230, but you got to add back in the land value at the very end. So you get the after seven years of depreciation, the value is properties valued at 330,000. Now, how did we get that 10 years again? Did we, what did we do with that? I'm sorry, how did you get that 10K, I mean? 
If it's a value of three hundred thousand dollars, you divided it by thirty. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Three hundred straight line lasts thirty years. That means the slope on this is ten thousand per year at seven years depreciation is a seventy thousand dollar loss one two three four five six seven goes up and hits the curve comes over to there that's 230 and that's how this curve works go over to there and then this one hits and goes over there as it goes out further in time you can see the value goes down because of the slant of that curve Now, I believe there's the very last calculation. I saved this one for last because this is one that is argued amongst appraisers everywhere. There is this thing called a gross rent multiplier. And a gross income multiplier. There is some jacked up appraisers or instructors even, I've looked at other instructors in different states that say the gross income is a monthly statement and the gross rent is a yearly statement. I am here to tell you that that is wrong. Gross rent only deals with the rental income, where gross income deals with all income. And what I'm telling you is this you get into an apartment complex. They may have rent as income. We all agree with that, right? Well, they also could have parking passes. They could have pool passes. They can have a laundry. They could have clubhouse rental. So in a gross rent multiplier, you would only look at this income. Let's say it's 100,000 per year. Parking is 5,000 per year. The pool's another 5,000. Laundry, they make 2,500. And the clubhouse rental, they make 2,500. If we were using a gross rent multiplier, of five, you literally would do exactly what it says. Gross rent multiplier. So it's five times the gross rent. This value of this property is $500,000. The other side of that coin is if I told you the gross income multiplier was four, now this is income. That is all of this together. So that's 110, $115,000. Four times 115, is $460,000. So the gross rent multiplier uses only the rent. The gross income multiplier 
uses all of the income. All right. That is the cram session, the best I could do it, based upon what we have been told from the testing facility giving us the outline and what percentages cover what. What I would suggest you do now, I get sent you or attached in the course was some math problems and a test, practice test in there with the answers. I would suggest you go through that practice exam, grade yourself, and then go back to the beginning and tell me what the other four reasons why they weren't the answer. So when you know that covenant of session was the answer, why wasn't the warranty forever the answer? And you say, well, warranty forever deals with the length of protection. Further assurance deals with, hey, I'm going to help you out. So now you, you see what I'm doing? I'm just trying to make you use those same questions to tell me why they weren't answers. Because to do that, you also have to know what it is. And that's going to help you study too. So it's just another way. At this point, I am. I think we have covered everything that we can cover. I want to remind you to feel free. You can still send me emails or call me. Let me know how you've done. If there's something else that you think we didn't cover enough of, also let me know upon that. All right, are there any questions? Peace out.